Welcome, everyone. We have registrants with us from 25 countries today, and we're so glad to have you here for the first in our new seminar series called Genomic Innovators. So I'm Dr. Chris Gunter, and I serve as NHGRI's Senior Advisor to the Director for Genomics Engagement. And I'm very pleased to host today with my longtime friend, Dr. Lisa Chadwick. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Chadwick. I'm a program director in NHGRI's Division of Genome Sciences, and I'm the lead of several of our programs that target early stage investigators, which includes the Genomic Innovator Award. And we also want to strongly thank the team at NHGRI who helped us organize this series, particularly Susan Vasquez and Gerald Samani, who are both wonderful and have helped us do a number of these. So thank you to them. So on this first slide here, you can see, as I mentioned, today is the first one in this new series. We will be hosting them quarterly. That's our plan. So the next one will be January-ish. But you can find out more details for the series that are listed on the web page here on the bottom if you're interested in the future. And we'll make sure to uh, let you know about them as well. Um, they'll be posted on our YouTube channel after. So if you enjoyed today's talk, feel free to share it later with your friends who could not make it because we all know they're competing meetings. We named this series both after the extramural funding program we had in the past Past, which Lisa was responsible for, uh, called the Genomic Innovator Awards, and after the fact that we bo view both of these speakers as true innovators in the field of genomics. So on the next slide, you can see more about our speakers, and I'm going to introduce both of them to you. So Dr. Luca Pinello is an associate professor at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He earned his PhD in computer science and mathematics from the University of Palermo in Italy. His research program uses computational approaches, which we'll tell you about today, to systematically analyze the sources of variation that affect gene regulation, including epigenetic variation, genetic variation, and single cell gene expression variability. And our second speaker, Dr. Karen Mulkey, is Professor of Genetics and Associate Chair for Research at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine, Chapel Hill. She earned her doctoral degree in human genetics at the University of Michigan. Her research program is identifying genetic variants that influence common human traits with complex inheritance patterns and also seeks to understand the biological function of identified variants and interactions between genes and environmental risk factors in disease pathogenesis. So while we're talking, we encourage you to put your questions for the speakers into the Q&A section, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. And then Dr. Chadwick will ask those questions of the speakers during the question period when the talks are finished. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Pinello. Hi everyone, it's a great pleasure <laughs> to be here. I'm really excited to kick off this seminar series. So today we're going to apply genomic battery with CRISPR technologies to uncover non-coding functional elements and their phenotypic effects. So uh, can you please enable the control of the slide? No, it's not, it's not working. Should I share my screen instead? Let me try. Okay, now it's working. So, yeah, so I want to, you know, first start with the disclosure, my slide of disclosure. And, you know, I want to now, like, briefly outline what we're going to talk today. So I want to briefly mention my transition from computer science to computational biology, and now, like, NGI really enabled this. And then I want to talk about the DNA puzzle and where we can focus in the genome to understand function, and then <clears throat> propose a framework uh, to essentially have a multi-scale exploration of the non-coding genome using CRISPR tiling screen. And then the second segment that you know, is related to, to you know, what I will present, Karen instead will highlight disease variants in non-coding functional elements, CRISPR technologies for variant ele element function, and also an outlook and future opportunities. So my lab you know, uh, is trying to combine computation experimental strategies to understand gene regulation. And we are working with different technologies and assays, including epigenomics, CRISPR genome editing, and single cell omics. <clears throat> and we are trying to answer two specific questions. The first one is 
how can we uncover and dissect function encoding elements in the genome? And the second one, how can we model sulfate choices? And today we'll focus on the first one. And this is just a brief slide about my career trajectory. I'm from this little town in Italy called Altavilla. And you know, I did my PhD in computer science in Palermo. And you know, as you can see from this slide, you know, my first you know, transition to computational biology was in 2011 during my postdoc. And throughout the years, as you can see, like NGRI has been really important providing funding to make me you know, to the next stage. So as a postdoc, you know, I received a K99, and then you know, I was promoted to a system professor. And then in 2019, I received this Genomic Innovator Award. They gave me so much freedom to explore my research direction. 2020, I was promoted to associate professor. In 2021, I joined the NGRI, NGRI IGVF consortium leading a characterization center. So just wanted to highlight this because there are a lot of funding sources that may enable other people to make the same transition. And this really helped me to create, you know, have the freedom to create over the years several computational tools and to do team science and to enable other researchers to do uh, cool analysis related to genomics, CRISPR genome editing, and also you know, nice and crazy visualization in virtual reality for single cell genomics. So going back to the question, you know, uh, I was really passionate about the, the genome because you know, there, there are so many puzzles yet you know, to solve. And as you know, the first draft, the first good draft was completed in 2001, but it was not until this you know, year that we have you know, the full a uh, complete sequence of, of the genome. And there are like several parts in you know, a highlight in you know, a random region of the genome. And they ask you like, what is the function of this small segment? You know, if you, if you have a coding, you know, sequence may be easier to, to, to spell out the function, but if you are in a, an encoding sequence, maybe it's not so easy. And, you know, the non-coding part is really important because 98% of our genome is non-coding. Still, you know, 80%, depending on which assay you use, is some biochemical activity. And most importantly, many of the disease-associated variants are in the non-coding space. And Karen, you know, will, will expand uh, on this point more. So what, you know, really made me, like, passionate as a computer sci scientist about studying genome function was, you know, essentially this, this puzzle. How come you know almost all the cells of you know all the cells of our body share almost the same code, but they have different output and phenotype and gene expression programs? And you know, to me, it was like really fascinating. And you know, over the years, I learned that <clears throat> one of the explanation to this puzzle is the chromatin structure. And you know, in fact, the way the DNA is folded is really different in different cell types. And different mechanisms essentially help to specialize this code. And, you know, these are, for example, nucleosome positioning, DNA methylation, and histone modification that you can think as a way, you know, of enable or disable part of, you know, this, of this genetic code and to create this, you know, gene uh, expression programs that are cell type specific. So this, you know, can also help us to think on where we want to focus, you know, in exploring this, this genome. Because, you know, the genome is quite large. We have 3 billion nucleotide pairs. So we need to think about where we want to focus in this uh, exploratory game. And what, what do we need, you know, to, to, to be smart? So one first thing is, like, we need some mechanisms to highlight regions that are important. Second, we need to, if we really want to understand the function, we need to perturb this region. And for this, we have gene editing technologies like CRISPR, and this can lead us to understand, you know, progressively, and, you know, we can iterate this framework. So in order to, you know, the first step, you know, highlight, there are many ways to highlight based on genetic variants, conservation here, you know, with you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proposing or, you know, many people are proposing is to use essentially accessible chromatin accessibility or particular histone modifications because this can highlight regions that are active and certain specific. In fact, in over the years, we have learned that, for example, different histone modifications are associated with different biological functions. For example, if you have a gene, you can immediately find 
promoters that may active or poise or repress and you know genes that are transcribed but one important mark you know is, is a mark that I mean, multiple marks that essentially allow you to highlight this distal region that are called enhancers and these are really important region in gene regulation because they are cell type specific and that to fine tune the genes uh, the gene expression in different cell types so this is the way we can potentially highlight and you know i want to highlight that you know we have so many you know so much data thanks to roadmap epigenomics and encode that profile, you know, histone marks, chromatin accessibility, and also binding on different proteins for many, many cell types, also primary cells. So in terms of uh, perturbation, there are like different um, gene editing technologies. One that you know, really changed the way, you know, we can um, do, you know, large scale screens is CRISPR genome editing that is composed by a Cas9 protein that has some cleavage activity. And then, you know, guide RNA that essentially can, um, can be programmed. So you can synthesize this region of around 20 base pair. And by simple co complementarity rules, you can essentially target this system almost anywhere in the genome. And this system will introduce double strain break that the cell will try to repair. And you know, you know, in this process, you will introduce deletion or short deletion or insertion or you can also trigger other mechanisms and provide a small piece of DNA to actually have precise replacement. So this is really powerful technique. You can design easily thousands of perturbation if, if you wish. And then, you know, over there, people have modified the Cas9, they disabled, you know, the cleavage activity, and there's this dead Cas9. And now you can fuse other, you know, effector or epigenetic modifier. And there are like, you know, this different, you know, version of this, but you know there are like you know names for for the different version. You know, a global name is like CRISPR I that essentially allows you to repress um, epigenetically a region in the genome, or CRISPR A that you know allows you to activate. And you know, for example, you can repress genes targeting at the promoter, or you know, creating new enhancers, you know, in in, in non coding non coding regions. So really exciting technology. So in terms of understanding, I want to tell you a, a brief story. And you know, this really shaped you know, the way I think about this also my career. So during my postdoc uh, in Guasheng Yuan lab, I had the fortune to collaborate with Swartork and Daniel Bauer. And you know, they were really interested in studying blood diseases and you know, sickle cell. And in 2013, they, they uncovered one answer that you know, was enriched for, for genetic variants associated with fetal hemoglobin. So at that time, we essentially decided to actually delete, you know, the, the answer using gene editing, and we saw that, you know, this answer was for a gene called BC11A. Indeed, was you know controlling BC11A, and BC11A being a repressor for fetal hemoglobin, the perturbation of this answer element was able to reactivate in a cell type specific fashion fetal hemoglobin, and this is really important because, you know, as you know, we have different Hemoglobin, we have the fetal one that only at the fetal stage, and then we have the, the adult one. So if you find, you know, a genetic switch or you know a perturbation that re-enable the fetal hemoglobin, you can ameliorate, you know, for example, sickle cell disease, providing a backup, you know, option. In 2015, we use again CRISPR technologies. This time, you know, instead of deleting the full and answer, we did the saturation mutagenesis screen. And we uncovered that actually you don't need the entire an answer to, to activate BC11A, but we uncover a, a small critical element that was a binding site for a, a, a combo of transcription factor GATA1 and TAL1. So you need a single perturbation, you know, around 10 base pair to essentially reactivate this fetal hemoglobin. And in 2019, we showed that this potentially can be a potential therapeutic avenue. So you can envision that you can modify human hepatopoietic stem cell ex vivo with this CRISPR technology with a single perturbation, and then you know, reinfuse these cells, and this can potentially ameliorate you know, this sickle cell. And this is actually a reality. In fact, in 2000, um, Oh, I cannot advance, oops, <laughs> sorry, the, the advancement is not working. Yeah, this is, I was saying, it's really, it's truly 
translational. In fact, in 2020, you know, the first patient, you know, was treated with this with this idea, and there are like several clinical trials. One, you know, led by Daniel Bauer, the Boston Children's Hospital, and you know. Today, like, you know, this year, there are already 20 patients that have like a really positive response using, using this. And, you know, I was really lucky to be part of, of this project developing all the computational tools that enable some of these uh, exploratory analysis. So now expanding on that, you know, these are really powerful frameworks so we can apply to other regions of the genome. So, and there is this concept of CRISPR tiling screen that, you know, <laughs> as my title, you know, mentioned, it's kind of playing battleship again against the genomes. So imagine you have a board and there are a few things that you want to discover. And now you have like, you know, this high throughput way to throw like, you know, perturbation on this board. And, you know, you have a way actually to see which perturbation is associated to, to the phenotype. To, the, to a phenotype of interest. And you, know, you can potentially use target and answer, you know, variants and, and, and so on. So, so in, in my Genomic Innovator Award, I was essentially proposing, well, you can do this in multiple ways, but how can we you know, optimally do this? So the idea is like, we can combine you know, different CRISPR genome editing technologies to efficiently first uncover and then dissect these regulatory elements. And it, what I mean, imagine you have like, you know, locus, a gene of interest associated to, you know, a phenotype. You can design different perturbation and, you know, you can start with, you know, low resolution. So you can use CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A that have, you know, 1 KB to 100 base pair resolution to uncover, you know, the first, you know, large elements. And then you can use genetic perturbation like Cas9 to tile this region precisely and you know, uncover you know, the sub-element that are important, you can envision even to use base editing or prime editing to, up, to go up to you know, one base pair resolution. And you know, this is something we're developing, we're really excited. excited. And, but you know, there are like already CRISPR tiling screen that you know, our group have you know, uh, performed. You know, for example, this is one you know, for this piece 11 I was mentioning. And also other group are you know developing these screens. So there is a clear you know need to develop the technology to enable other people to do this at high scale and you know for different phenotypes. And you know, in this slide, you see you know, three papers using three different technology, Cas9, CRISPR, and CRISPR I for different goals, you know, an answer the section as we did, or an answer discovery, as you know, in this two other paper they propose. In terms of the analysis. There are like different ways to do this. And, you know, I would propose one way that essentially unify all the different, you know, uh, strategies that we have so far. So just to provide a little bit more detail on the CRISPR tile screen, the idea is like we start from a locus of interest with design. That means that, you know, we take all the small sequences that we, we can use to deploy our perturbation to target our perturbation. Then you know we create our library of, of perturbation, and we can lentivirally transduce our cells. So we can introduce the perturbation in the cells. So these circular the cells, and we want to have one perturbation per cell. And then you know you can sort based on a phenotype of interest. For example, it can be fetal hemoglobin level, can be like the expression of a gene of interest, can be viability as a surface marker. This depends on the phenotype that you want to study. Now that you have, you know, these two population, you can try to recover the guide, you know, enrichment in this high and low population. And, you know, just to provide a little bit more detail, what you do essentially you sequence. So in each cell, you will integrate, you have a lentiviral integrand that, you know, is integrated in the genome. And, you know, the part around the, the guide RNA, this perturbation is, is the same. So you can just design primer, amplify, and, you know, you can create this nice table, and you know, calculate based on the, the the log fold change between these two numbers, you can get you know a one D track that is the enrichment score. And then based on this, you can essentially understand which part is important associated to your phenotype. And you know, this seems all simple. So you know, I level, you know, we start from reads, a fast file. That what we want is something like this, you know, this denoise signal. That tells us, you know, this association and maybe some statistical test that tells you, you know, like, okay, this region is the, the the one that you should, you know, follow up. 
And there are a lot of steps that you need to do right in between. So in order to do that, we created a tool called CRISPR Surf that is based on you know, the, the idea of the convolution. This was led by Jonathan Su, who was a PhD student in my lab and a um, kid Jung lab. So the idea of the convolution, the convolution. So we want to uncover you know, the true you know, underlying regulatory signal in the genome, but we have an imperfect measurement system that you know, is our you know, the CRISPR perturbation. And then, you know, this essentially introduced like some distortion to our signal. So with the, the convolution, essentially we want to go back to this, to this signal. And this depends, of course, you know, on the kind of perturbation that you use. So if you use genetic perturbation, you have, you know, resolution around 10 base pair, and these are the small indels. If you use epigenetic perturbation, you have much larger, you know, like perturbation. So you have a lower resolution, you know, of one around 200 base pair. So, so in the in the measurement problem, what we do is like you can envision that you know this CRISPR perturbation is like you, you essentially you can measure you know this signal here, and if you have the perfect tool, you will observe essentially the perfect reconstruction. But with this Cas9 and CRISPR A, you get you know, a smoothed version, and this operation is called convolution. So, so now, like, you know, you can frame this as a convolutional model. So you have, you know, what you want to recover. You have your perturbation with CRISPR. Of course, we have noise and we want to recost, you know, and this is what we observe, you know, the, the, the noisy signal. We want to reconstruct the original, you know, the, the original signal. And for this, you know, the good news is like there are several frameworks for the convolution. Here we propose to use generalized loss so that, you know, essentially is a way to go from something like this to something that you know is parsimoniously try to under, you know explain what we observe in the, the signal and you know you can learn more in our paper. So we tested this in multiple CRISPR screen and you know we show that this is a generalizable approach no matter which perturbation type you use and you can recover the same validated elements and also new candidates. We also did the dual screen targeting you know, the BC11A locus and several um, chromatin accessible sites with CRISPR-I and Cas9. And, you know, one thing that is nice when you have this dual data on the on, on exactly the same region, you can clearly see the value of, you know, this multi-scale resolution. For CRISPR-I, you recover these three enhancers, but with Cas9, you recover, you know, the critical element. You have a much finer resolution. And also, you know, if you use genetic perturbation, you can assess the effect of coding region, whereas with epigenetic perturbation, you cannot do that. And then finally, I just want to say that our lab is really passionate about building tools that are usable and user-friendly. So we build this website that can assist you in the design of the experiment and as well in the deconvolution and then you know, the follow-up annotation and analysis. So this is online, the, the code is open source. And you know, if you want to try, you know, like please let me know and you're happy to provide support. And the last slide, you know, there are exciting things I did. I just show you like some tools based on CRISPR I, CRISPR A, and Cas9. But now we are using you know this new editor, base editor and prime editing that allows you to have you know really high resolution to uh, you know potentially change up to a single nucleotide. And also we are exploring a new framework for CRISPR tiling screen, where we envision that instead of reading the guide RNA enrichment, we can read directly the alleles and we can potentially develop tools to leverage you know, this, this allele, you know, allele uh, frequency in the different population. And with this, I would like to you know, acknowledge current collaborators, past collaborators and people in my lab and you know, especially also my funding source in the energy right, that really you know helped me to make this transition, supported my career in multiple stages. And you know, for people that are excited about CRISPR technologies, there is a free conference you know, next month, and you know, we have like stellar speakers. So if you want to learn more, you know, please join us. We'll be online, and you can also send an abstract if you want. And you know, I will stop here. I will end off to Karen. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, I will now add some context to the use of CRISPR technologies to identify mechanisms responsible for common disease that include variants in non-coding regulatory elements, and then some perspectives on the future. So many common variants associated with uh, common diseases and their related traits have been identified by genome-wide association studies or GWAS analysis. Uh, an example shown here is a recent uh, results of a genome-wide uh, association study screen for variants associated with LDL cholesterol uh, levels. However, most of the variants that may be responsible for these association signals are located in non-coding regions. Thus, a key goal to understand the heritable contributions to disease risk is to identify the genes responsible for the associations. And identifying the specific variants and their molecular mechanisms rigorously links disease risk to gene function. So for non-coding variants, a frequently applied uh, strategy is to examine the non-coding variants located in regulatory elements that correspond to disease-relevant uh, cells or tissue types. So I'm going to show two examples where experimental manipulations with uh, CRISPR-based technologies provided needed validation of the hypothesized links between uh, variants and genes. And these hypotheses are based on genetic strategies to evaluate how variants um, exhibit regulatory effects. So first we hypothesize that variants that um, are associated with gene expression levels and also with a trait or disease uh, may function through that effect on that gene to influence the disease. And then to further understand how the variants may be affecting gene expression levels, examine the chromatin context of those variants. So variants associated with um, a chromatin characteristics such as accessibility uh, that are also associated with gene expression and a trait or disease may be acting through that effect on the regulatory element to influence the gene and the trait. So here's uh, a first example. Um, starting with a genome-wide association study for uh, glucose levels zoomed into this uh, one region. This was performed in about 58,000 individuals. Uh, the same set of variants are also associated with um, islet RNA-seq-based expression levels of uh, the gene in this region, ADCY5. The variants associated with lower uh, gene expression level were associated with higher glucose levels and higher uh, risk of diabetes. Now, the function of this uh, gene and its expression in pancreatic islets suggested that the variant may act to alter insulin secretion. So when examining the set of variants that could be responsible for this association signal, uh, we compared the locations of those variants to regulatory elements in especially pancreatic islets. And you can see this variant located here is located within a region of accessible chromatin based on two technologies, fair and DNA hypersensitivity, and in a region that is a an enhancer um, based uh, chromatin state in islets and um, really limited to not many other uh, cell types. So we first set out to, uh, as a first step to understand mechanism, tested that, that particular variant, the trait-associated variant in its regulatory element for effects on transcriptional activity. So shown here, uh, we analyzed that variant um, in a reporter assay and, uh, in the regulatory element, and uh, both the, the regulatory element with either allele shows enhancer activity. However, the A allele at the variant shows reduced enhancer activity, and that's consistent with the lower levels of uh, ADCY5 expression in the EQTL analysis. Now, while this experiment shows that the variant is capable of altering transcriptional activity, it does not validate the link from the variant to the gene or to gene function. And so for that manipulation, we turned to uh, CRISPR. The regulatory element um, spanning this uh, variant is conserved across species. 
allowing us to use a rat cell model that secretes insulin well. So in this experiment, we generated two double-stranded uh, breaks, uh, deleting the intronic regulatory element uh, from the genome, and we obtained clonal lines with homozygous uh, deletions. And we then measured the effect of gene expression, the effect of these deletions on gene expression and on cell function. So here, I show that the uh, when the regulatory element is deleted in the homozygous enhancer deletion uh, clonal lines, the gene expression level of the ADCY5 gene is reduced compared to lines that were created uh, uh, that were not targeting, not that did not generate uh, deletions. A nearby gene, SEC22A, was not affected. Its gene expression was not affected, suggesting that that deletion was um, limited in its uh, impact. What about function of those cells? Does reducing, does removing this uh, regulatory element alter um, the cell capabilities? And here I show that those deletion enhancer, the, the deletions of the enhancer show reduced um, secretion of insulin compared to the mock edited cells. So we can build a mechanism looking at the variant, its effects on enhancer activity, uh, that association with expression level in uh, pancreatic islets from individuals, the association with uh, glucose levels and risk of diabetes, and this um, evidence now with the uh, CRISPR-based deletion of the regulatory element makes that connection between the variant and the regulatory element and the gene, as well as its uh, function in disease. Now, this strategy is this application of CRISPR technology is pretty low throughput. Targeting efficiency is low, requiring ex extensive screening uh, of clonal lines and really setting priorities among variant containing elements. So in this case, we were motivated by that evidence that the variant affects transcriptional activity, that the element was uh, limited in the cell types um, in which it was uh, uh, an enhancer, it should, um, has characteristics of enhancers, that there were really few other candidate variants in elements that could be responsible for this GWAS signal based on those annotations, that this element was conserved across species and some other experimental and annotation uh, support, some allelic imbalance in chip seq data and evidence of, of specific binding proteins. I'll now turn to an example of using CRISPR technologies to understand uh, genetic effects on regulatory elements, gene expression and disease. So here we started by generating chromatin accessibility data in a pilot study of uh, human liver samples from 20 individuals. Uh, we performed a tax seek uh, to identify the accessible chromatin regions, uh, identified peaks uh, spanning the genome, and then tested variants that were located within one kilobase of the site of one of these uh, peaks or regulatory elements to ask whether the alleles at that uh, variant were associated with the level of accessibility. So in this study, we identified more than 3,000 regions across the genome where this was the case. We then compared these chromatin QTL uh, signals to genome-wide association signals um, uh, to identify uh, potential functions. So an example of that chromatin uh, association is shown here. These are profiles of uh, attack seq data from nine different individuals uh, shown across the, the, the width of the screen and the uh, peaks then that are called as um, regulatory elements are shown below. Now you can see that most of these elements, most of these um, uh, chromatin accessibility is similar across individuals, but in one region, the chromatin accessibility differs between individuals and the genotype of a variant located within that regulatory element uh, is shown over here on the left. And you can see that individuals with, that are homozygous for the T allele have stronger evidence of accessibility uh, than individuals homozygous for the C allele. 
So this is um, a chromatin QTL uh, variant. These elements are um, more often found, these, the ones that are genetically regulated are a little bit more often found in enhancers um, and in promoters uh, when compared to chromatin states uh, from liver tissue in the uh, Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium. The presence of some additional uh, elements in otherwise uh, termed quiescent regions suggests that perhaps the greater genetic diversity of the individuals profiled here uh, helped identify additional uh, regulatory elements uh, in the liver. So this region that I uh, showed that's a chromatin QTL is also a, gene, uh, a signal that is associated with LDL cholesterol levels and with expression level of uh, the uh, LITAF gene in liver samples. So the LDL data is from around a million individuals. That GWAS study, the EQTL data is from around 1,000 individuals. And here, the same variant that was the lead, most strongly associated with LDL cholesterol and with gene expression, was also the most strongly associated with uh, the accessibility of this peak here, the three prime end of the LITAF gene. This gene uh, potentially plays a role in more than one cell type within the liver tissue um, that we examined. Uh, and the variant within the regulatory element is really, there are three variants that are found all close together, located in the same regulatory element that are all proxies from one another. So again, as a first step, we tested these variants uh, within the regulatory element to see if they could alter transcriptional activity. So here tested as a haplotype, and we examined four different cell types that could be uh, playing a role in the liver tissue. In all four cell types, we observed the same uh, result that both haplotypes, both that the regulatory element uh, serves as an enhancer compared to the um, empty vector, and that the alleles that were associated with greater chromatin accessibility showed greater transcriptional activity. These are the same uh, set of alleles that are associated with higher uh, liver expression of LITAF in the EQTL analysis and higher cholesterol levels in the uh, GWAS data. So uh, again, this uh, does not demonstrate the data you do not yet validate the role of the regulatory element uh, on the gene. So here to do that test, we used CRISPR interfer um, interference in a hepatocarcinoma cell line. Luca introduced this strategy earlier, and we used guide RNAs spanning the enhancer and compared them to non-targeting guide RNAs. And in this preliminary experiment, the knockdown uh, leads to a significant reduction in expression level of the LITAF uh, gene. So these data provide important validation of the hypothesized link uh, to the gene. The CRISPR-I system is much more amenable to higher throughput studies as the guide RNAs can be designed to many regulatory elements, uh, including promoters, um, and to measure the effect of altering uh, gene regulation as well as gene expression. So what does the future hold for CRISPR technologies to identify non-coding functional elements and their phenotypic effects? Well, first, there will be uh, improved CRISPR technologies, many technological advances, continued development of the biochemistry of editing, and the design of effective guide RNAs. Guide design that better considers the diversity of human variants will improve both the efficiency of targeting and reduce off-target effects, especially as more diverse genomes are, are edited. Um, newer technologies, as Luke introduced, of base editing and uh, prime editing hold promise for more precise nucleotide changes with higher efficiency. Improved design of the biochemical aspects of CRISPR-I and its counterpart CRISPR activation can enable study of the consequences of a wider range of changes uh, to gene expression levels. Screens can become more comprehensive and test a larger number of variants and elements in a wider set of cell types, cell states, and organisms. 
and improved signal cell technologies will enable DNA and RNA to be profiled at scale, facilitating understanding of genetic effects in these specific cell types. And finally, we can anticipate more in vivo applications, uh, including to treat and reduce the impact of human disease. The future will also hold a more comprehensive understanding of non-coding functional elements and their phenotypic effects. So non-coding regulatory elements differ by cell environment, by specific cell states, and their uh, the, the, the cell types and their various cell states that um, differ during development and in response to perturbations of the cell environment. And non-coding elements also uh, differ by genotype. And we'll learn about these effects through the CRISPR saturation mutagenesis screens, as Luca mentioned, and the study of natural human uh, genetic variation in more and more individuals. One community that is performing this type of research is the new IGVF uh, consortium. This consortium has multiple goals to understand the impact of genomic variation on function, and I've listed two of them here. And one is to apply technologies like the ones that we have described to uh, systematically perturb the genome and figure out the, vari the effects of uh, variation, of variants and elements on uh, genome function and phenotype. And also to perform high resolution identification of where and when genes and regulatory elements uh, function. Luca is a program director for one of the projects uh, des as described here. And he and his team are using base editing uh, CRISPR screens to identify and examine the function of variants responsible for blood and heart diseases. And in one aspect of this project, Luca's team is collaborating with a team at UNC uh, to examine variant function results across technologies and strategies. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people who contributed to the projects I showed, including uh, the people in my group, past and present, our collaborators at UNC uh, and uh, elsewhere. Great. Thank you both so much for those great talks. Um, we have some time now to answer questions from the audience. So remember, if you have a question for our speakers, uh, go ahead and post it in the Q&A box and I will ask it. Um, I'm going to start with a question and then I'll uh, ask some of the other ones we've gotten in the chat while you both were talking. So Luca, you know, the work that you talked about uses tools and technologies that are still relatively new. How have those kind of changed the way that you both have been able to address uh, the questions that your lab is interested in and how accessible are these kinds of technologies to, to other researchers? Yes, um, very good question. So I think, you know, like we have seen a revolution, you know, like for example, with CRISPR, you know, single cell technologies. And, you know, initially, you know, they were not so accessible, but now like so many labs can easily, you know, deploy this technology, you know. And, you know, one barrier sometimes, sometimes is like, having the computational tools, but now there are like several programs, including this genomic innovator that, you know, like helping a researcher, you know, like me that are excited about developing tools to help others, right? So I think, you know, like it's a nice, you know, framework, right? You know, there are new technology and I think now like we're much faster in adopting new technologies and, you know, with, you know, sharing, you know, it's like more open, you know, we share, you know, reagents. And so I, I think, you know, like I see like a really positive future, you know, there will be new technologies, but we have you know, already a system of to share, you know, like this technology as well, you know, computational tools. So, yeah, that's my short, you know, view on this. Great. So one of the questions that we had in the chat was uh, about the difference between discovering enhancers and dissecting enhancers. I think probably like what kind of tools would you use? What kind of information are you looking for? Can you guys speak to that a little bit? I can start with that one and say that 
uh, identifying where the enhancers are located and which cell types they are active in requires uh, looking at those different and having access to the different cell types, tissues, uh, cell states of, of interest. Um, I think that the dissection of the enhancer is identifying um, how does that, how does changes to that enhancer have an effect? How do, we talked a bunch about DNA variants that have an influence on uh, the enhancer. They may be acting by um, changing accessibility to the chromatin, by changing which transcription, you know, the availability of the uh, sequence to transcription factors that can bind and um, have their effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, maybe in terms of technology, one point I was trying to <clears throat> highlight in my talk, you know, you can delete completely, you know, one sequence and see, like, do you see that, you know, the gene that you, you know, you think, you know, is regulating change expression, right? So you, you can have this direct, you know, assessment, you can use CRISPR-I, and, you know, you can try to shut down that and once again, you see if the gene is changing. And then dissect means that, you know, you already know that maybe this is an enhancer, right? And now you want to know what is the critical part, you know, what are the maybe 10 base pair or, you know, 20 base pair that are important for this activity. And, you know, one example that we show, like, in you know, in BC11A story was you just need a single binding site to shut, you know, to, to perturb a single binding site to shut down that enhancer. So that's, you know, that difference between the discovery and then, you know, the dissection. Cool. So I think the next three questions that I saw in the chat kind of all relate to the types of things that are biology that will still make it more difficult for you to do these kinds of experiments. So the first one is about the repetitive nature of the genome. Of course, mm -hmm. there is everything from small duplications in the genome to even large scale duplications like segmental duplications. How do you deal with that repetitive nature of the genome when you're designing these CRISPR perturbations? Does that make it more complicated for you to analyze the data? How do you sort of deal with that in these kinds of experiments? Yeah, I avoid those regions, so I think Luke yeah. can answer this question. Yeah, no. As I mean, this is really, you know, a good question, you know, like, uh, you know, you can, depending on the perturbation sides, you can say, well, you know, I can try to stay on the side. Hopefully, like, you know, if you have, for example, again, CRISPR-I, you know, this thing will spread and, you know, you, you know, if you're lucky, it will still, you know, shut down, you know, or activate the region. But if you have, like, you know, more precise, you know, perturbation, and you know, if you you know you have the same region in, in you know thousands of places of the genome, then it's really hard to understand the effect of the perturbation because you don't know anymore what you are perturbing. So you know, unfortunately, I don't have a solution for this. And yeah, but it's a really good question. Yeah. So the, the next. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Karen. Well, the related question about. Uh, cell type and developmental stage, right, offers opportunities to use to, to evaluate the cells at different stages of differentiation, either, you know, cells in a dish. And so from multiple individuals like iPSC derived cells that are differentiated or in the process of differentiation into different cell types, you can examine both the effect of variants and any perturbations to those cells and the change in uh, developmental stage to understand their impacts. Mm -hmm. And I think sort of the next part of that question about cell type context and how important that is, is like, how do you even know necessarily whether you have the right cell type in your assay? And how do you deal with that uncertainty when you're designing these kinds of studies? So yeah, I'm looking, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Karen, please. I'm looking forward to and making use of the single cell uh, data that is helping identify what the underlying cell types are. Um, and because the data that we generate in bulk tissue uh, leaves that still a bit of a mystery. And so identifying, say, the chromatin QTL in bispecific cell types can help um, elucidate some of that where the action is happening. 
Yeah, no, Karen, you're saying, oh, sorry, go ahead, Luca. And you know, there are like you know papers, you know, that show like already in, you know current in QTL or you know QTL the value actually decomposing this you know in different cell types or you know subpopulation, even you know continuous uh, like you know uh, like uh, trajectories, right? So you have way more power, you know, to detect these signals. Mm -hmm. So Karen's been doing a great job of leading into the next part of the question, which is move as we move into things like single cell assays, uh, that generates a ton more data and probably a ton more computational challenges. Can you talk about sort of the biggest challenges of analyzing this data and sort of what maybe is the next important advancement in the field that's going to facilitate analysis of these sort of large scale CRISPR screens in a single cell sort of assay? environment yeah, that's maybe probably I can, a luca question I, yeah i can start from that you know you know if we think about no computation but you know what what is my dream you know i think what what we miss right now like especially if we want to assess you know element you know or variant you know perturbation to phenotypes you can think you know maybe as the easiest one you know change in gene expression the current in you know, assays are still based on you know the guide count, so you actually don't see the the alleles that you're creating in this single cell. So you have you know this RNA readout. So it's really hard to you know have a definitive you know or high resolution you know answer if you cannot read you know what you're doing in individual cells. So in terms of technology, you know I know there are some effort in this direction, but we are still not yet there. You know they are not scalable. But that's you know the one thing that can change you know a little bit the game. In terms of computational analysis, you know it's becoming harder and harder because you know the scale you know is increasing. You know we have like you know several companies and labs that are innovating, and you know like the the kind of skills that you need to develop. You know you know you know for example if you're a postdoc or a trainee or you know a research scientist, you need now to learn you know like things related to big data or, you know, start to learn how to use GPUs or, you know, other techniques that, you know, before were not necessary, but at the same time is a, an exciting challenge, right? You know, like I'm not complaining, actually, I see this as an opportunity to, to actually leverage this new tech computational technologies and, you know, data structure that were, you know, adopted in different fields. So there was a question in the chat about combinatorial regulatory interactions. So of course, you know, one of these regulatory elements is probably not necessarily working by itself, but that adds a whole other layer of complexity to the whole thing. So how do you use these kinds of tools and methods that you talked about to look at the combinatorial effects of different regulatory elements? We're really stumping you guys here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, these are good questions. I mean, I think, you know, like, this is a super exciting area. And, you know, there are, like, some technical limitations. You know, if you think about single cell, you know, as a readout, um, you know, how many cells can you really profile and how many combinations you can explore? So if you have already an hypothesis about, you know, a small number of elements that can, you know, have, you know, some synergistic effect, you can design the screens, but you know, if you want to, you know, think broad, you know, I don't think we have, you know, the the technology, you know, the funding, you know, level to explore, you know, the time to explore, you know, this large, you know, the large combinatorial space. So we need to be really careful in, you know, rational design, you know, the pairs, you know, or you know, the combination that we want to explore. So yeah, that, that's my 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 take on this. I agree. Prioritizing starting with elements that um, show an effect and then designing specifically which combinations to evaluate is the practical short-term way forward to be able to uh, investigate those combinations. So I see a question in the chat that reminded me of one that I had planned to ask you about. So, um, Luca, you received the Genomic Innovator Award for the to help you fund this work. Um, that is, as you know, a uh, 
grant mechanism that's a little bit different from sort of the standard grant mechanisms. This is kind of the boring talk about NIH funding, but it uses a, the R35 mechanism, which is much broader in scope and less tied to like very specific research goals. Um, so how has that helped you uh, pursue those, this kind of work? Has that flexibility been important in sort of helping advance the work in your lab? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think this this grant has been really transformative for me. You know, I'm I'm a really collaborative person. You know, like I'm excited about too many things. <laughs> so you know, having the flexibility, you know, to to do things that you know will advance maybe one area that can be gene regulation, but having the flexibility to collaborate, you know, broadly with many labs. You know, these are really you know enable me to you know create many tools because you know the, the way we envision I'm really excited about new technologies related to gene regulation broadly and then you can contact different labs that you know generate data or you know design together you know experiments and you know I think you know this is really different if you have like a rigid structure where you have you know a particular disease or a particular phenotype that you want to study that you know it's really important research you know I like the model as well but you know for kind of team science, I think you know, the Genomic Innovator Award, you know, really enables to do that without worrying too much about completing, you know, this sub aim, right? So, so mm -hmm. yeah, I'm really grateful, you know, for, for this and, you know, it's really helping, helping my career, you know, in, you know, in, in the past few years. Yeah, you mentioned the team science aspect. That was another sort of unique feature of the genomic innovator was that it was open to people who had been involved in some team science kind of projects. And I think, uh, you know, some of your previous work in ENCODE and what you guys will be doing in IGVF are good examples of how those team science approaches can be so important in helping us address big scientific questions that we couldn't really do quite as well on our own and in individual labs. Yeah, I totally agree. So the, the other question here then is also about funding and it's about funding and maintaining software tools. That's also a challenge and you've developed a number of software tools. You know, how do you uh, in your lab maintain them? Uh, how do you support them? How do you fund them in, in your lab? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I mean, it's really also hard, you know, question. So it's really hard because, you know, like, you know, I don't think we there are like specific mechanisms, maybe, you know, this is my ignorance, but I don't know many mechanisms that are specifically designed to maintain softwares. And, you know, unless, you know, your software is like so famous and, you know, foundational, you know, if you have like multiple softwares, it's really hard to maintain them. And, you know, my, my strategy, you know, my practical strategy is like trying to use technologies like containers, you know, people probably have heard about Docker, that essentially, you know, that thing that you did, you know, like when you develop, it will always work, right? So this is like, you know, a partial solution, because, you know, you to, you know, maintain, then, you know, like you have to, you know, stay in this, you know, if we can say in this cage, right, you know, you have this, you know, small, so it's really hard, you know, then to maintain long term, but at least, you know, would be always reproducible and can always run the way you were intended. So I think it's a really hard, you know, question and maybe, you know, something that, you know, we can say, you know, we need more funds, you know, for boring things like maintaining software without no innovation, just, you know, like, Helping, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not the funding, you know, um, agency, but I think it's really important problem. So yeah, whoever raised this, you know, like yeah, really good point, and you know, I think we should all be aware that you know some software will be abandoned, you know, if there are no funding that you know will support the, you know, the the, the development and the maintenance. Right. So um, I see it. there are so many good questions in the chat now. So one of them is about something that uh, NHGRI feels is really important and it has been talking about a lot lately, which is the importance of 
including uh, participants with diverse genetic ancestries in our research and how we really need to build that in from the start so that we can make the work that we do applicable to all populations. How do you both think about that when you're uh, developing studies in this sort of area? I can start there. We learn a lot from every genetic variant that can be studied and there are more variants present uh, across the uh, the world in individuals of all populations than are found in just single populations. And so uh, we follow up and um, focus on, try to identify the basis for the association signals identified across those different uh, uh, populations. All of the biology that gets discovered is relevant to all of us humans. It's just the opportunities that we have to uh, characterize them and identify them through the presence of those variants. And it means that when we test and evaluate the, the roles of, of variants that we can uh, learn more about how elements, variants and elements impact uh, genes. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with that also, you know, like for example, talking about IGVF, you know, this was one, you know, specific points that, you know, we had to think together, you know, thinking about, you know, like, you know, in, being inclusive and, you know, like for, for my side, you know, I'm working with, you know, genetics that, you know, can help us to think, you know, to say, what are the data? So just think broadly. And, you know, there are like some gaps that, you know, we need to fill, but, you know, it might be to see that, you know, these themes are, you know, more and more important and, you know, maybe, also required, you know, for some funding mechanism. So I'm going to ask another one of my questions. So Karen and Luca both know that I'm involved in another NHGRI program called Gregor. Um, what Gregor is doing is trying to address a problem that we have in human disease genetic research, which is that the standard way that we look for the mutations that cause different genetic disorders uh, which is called exome sequencing, is very often, like more than half the time, not able to find the mutation that causes the disease. And exome sequencing is one of those look under the lamppost type assays where it's looking in the most likely place, um, the exons. But that's, of course, only a very small portion of the genome. Uh, these other mutations that are harder to find could be anywhere, and I'm sure a lot of them will end up being in things like these regulatory regions like enhancers. You both talked about some great examples of how those kinds of mutations could lead to disease. But one problem is that when you're looking at such a big part of the genome, it's really hard to look through all of the variants and figure out which ones might be most important and help decide which ones to follow up on. So I wonder if either of you could comment about how these kinds of tools uh, or the resources that might be developed by programs like IGVF might help researchers who are trying to look for those harder to find disease mutations? Yeah, no, but that's a really good question. I think, you know, we have different ways to prioritize variants. You know, IGVF, we have a lot of, you know, active discussions about, you know, including, you know, like an existing annotation, you know, fine mapping or other tools. And, you know, then thinking really hard about, you have too many things that you can, you know, you can test, you know, for example, if you want to perturb. So what is the optimal way to rank them, you know, like if you want to, you know, efficiently, you know, explore this space. And then, you know, there are like, for example, within a GVF, you know, predictive modeling groups that, you know, are creating, you know, machine learning methods to help us, you know, to like potentially predict the impact. And, you know, we acknowledge that, you know, the tools are not perfect, but if we have, you know, this effort of creating, you know, perturbation and redoubt, we can improve, you know, you know, something that, you know, within a GVF we call the active learning strategy. So we're envisioning that, you know, it's not something we are going to solve in one year, but over the years we become better and better, you know, with these efforts. So mm -hmm. I don't know, Karen, you know, if you want to... <laughs> I think the continued discovery of regulatory elements, recognizing that what we've discovered so far is um, mostly still at the basal sort of cell state or tissue state, and that identifying um, the, the elements across more cell types 
and in these perturbed <clears throat> environments, maybe those relevant to the rare diseases, could help identify, characterize those elements, make the elements available. So then when characterizing, when looking through those large number of potential genetic variants responsible for a rare disease, to have some guidance, some priorities, perhaps based on uh, the most relevant regulatory elements. Mm -hmm. And I see another question in the chat that's sort of related to this. I think you probably sort of answered it, but like these kinds of methods could also be used to help understand some of the variability that we see in these Mendelian disorders. Even when we can find the mutation, we still know that there's a lot of difference in the phenotypes that you see in different individuals, even with the same mutation. And so these kinds of tools and understanding variants in these kinds of elements could help explain. <coughs> so I see um, one question in here. Oh, so uh, the Genomic Innovator Program, of course, is a program targeted at early career researchers. So people who had not had a major NIH grant before. Um, Luca, what advice do you have for an early career person who's maybe still working on their PhD who's starting to get into this kind of an area? Yeah, I think, you know, like um, my suggestion, I mean, I mean, some are obvious, like, you know, reading a lot of papers, <laughs> but, you know, one thing that, you know, uh, you know, is important, it was really important for me, try to follow the technology. Right, you know, trying to see what are the new technologies and trying to envision like what what may happen, you know, with this new technology. Because you know, there are like these waves, you know, that you know we we all experience. They were all, you know, like related to new technologies, you know, sequencing technology, single cell, you know, perturbation, and then you know they were like they were enabling so many new things. So, you know, I think this really helped me to to see, you know, a little bit where the field, you know was going and there were like surprises, of course, but I think, you know, like this is one, you know, one suggestion that I have. And then also being really open, you know, like trying to, you know, you know, like going to specific conferences and, you know, where, you know, you have a mix of different, you know, like, you know, technology, biological talks and, you know, just connecting and talking to people, I think is like really important. I mean, two that, you know, I really like, and, you know, I'm not associated with them. You know, one is biology of genomes at Cospin Garber and, you know, ASAG that, you know, is also fantastic, you know, like, um, so these are, you know, two meetings I tried to attend and they're really broad and, you know, you can connect with many people and, you know, so, so these are, you know, some suggestions. So I cannot let this kind of a question pass without telling everyone who's uh, on this webinar too that another important thing in being successful in this kind of research is talking to the program officers uh, at the institute that is most relevant to your work. There are a lot of uh, colleagues of mine, including me and other people in my division who are here really to help you. Uh, think about your research, how to get it funded, what are the best opportunities. Uh, for that. So make sure that you contact program officer. And I also am putting a link in the chat, and I'm hoping that this shows for everyone, to a web page that we have put together that has uh, some information about uh, funding opportunities for new and early stage investigators. Um, there's some just some general information, uh, links to different events that we have, like a grant workshop at ASHG. Um, and funding opportunities that are open specifically to early career researchers. And, you know, talk at the conferences, you know, that's you know, another thing that is so important. You know, often you go to these conferences, so it's some, sometimes it's so nice just to chat in person. So let me look through these questions here. So I saw one about, okay, we talked earlier about the importance of cellular context on looking at uh, functional elements like enhancers. Uh, of course, uh, there's like also the level of how different cells within an organ interact with each other and how that might influence how different uh, functional elements work. Uh, can you apply technologies like this in more complex systems like organoids? And if not, sort of what are the challenges in doing that? Or maybe none of you have, have tried that yet. 
Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I've not tried that. I mean, it's a nice question, you know, like, uh, again, you know, I, I don't do personally experiment in my lab, but I think you know, it's a, for sure, you know, it's a really important direction. So CRISPR editing has been implemented in model organisms. Uh, mm -hmm. And so model organisms are maybe that step beyond um, organoids. And so it is feasible. And I think important when it's not just one cell type that, and you're not looking for some cell autonomous uh, result to be able to look at the relationship between cells and the impact of a um, change in one cell to um, how it influences the others. Mm -hmm. So I see a couple of questions in here that are related to another sort of important area for NHGRI, and that is about sharing data. So um, the one question is sort of how do you share this kind of data that comes out of your lab from these kinds of experiments? And then how will programs like IGBF share the data that comes out of uh, that program so that it can be of use for people, for example, who are trying to interpret whether a specific variant might be important in a disease? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think, you know, I'm always uh, saying, you know, we always need to share the raw data, you know, the, you know, the, the, the closest to the raw data, and then we need to share as well the methods that we use to process this data and you know to you know reach our conclusions and you know for this there are like you know for raw data you know we have geo for example for you know sequencing data for you know code we have like github or you know other rep and for methods you know like you know assemble methods you know there are like different avenues where you can put like you know the the the, the soft version of, of your software that you use and then, you know, like journals have been more and more, you know, demanding on this in, in a good way, right? You know, that you need to actually share, you know, like, you know, and, and for some other, you know, option, there are like, you know, fixed share, you know, Zanodo. And so, you know, we have like a system in place, you know, to share. So, you know, if we don't do that, you know, it's our fault. And, you know, like, I, I think, you know, it's ridiculous now, like to see some people, you know, we will share upon request, you know, like this is something that, I think, you know, we should go away from that, you know, it should be the default that you share and you should not have this statement, you know, and I know it's a lot of work to, <laughs> to, to reach the point that you are confident in sharing your code and all the data, but I think, you know, the standard should be higher, you know, it should not be possible to say, well, you know, if, if I, if I, you know, if you contact me, I will share the data, you know, in terms of a GVF, it's really nice, you know, to see that, you know, there are a lot of, again, discussion, you know, we're the planning year, thinking really hard about how can we maximize, you know, the data that we are going to generate and share and, you know, how to make sure that we share, you know, to a level that, you know, would be used, right? Yeah. And, you know, so there would be like, you know, the raw data, you know, preprocessed state, and then there would be something that we call the catalog that, you know, will essentially be something really accessible to the community that will also evolve over the years. So. I don't know, Karen, do you want to add your view? Right, so I, IGVF, like many NHGRI consortia, is very uh, interested in getting that data available and available as soon as possible. Um, and so um, being able to obtain, the, it will be feasible to obtain data that's generated even prior to being published. And then this catalog idea is to try to combine the data from multiple different types of experiments and types of, of data characterization and predictions uh, to make that data more accessible. That's quite the challenge. So I think that it is a, a, a long-term uh, 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 process. One of the goals of IGVF is to also make it a possible for others to perform the kinds of experiments that are being done in that consortium. And so uh, making available protocols and trying to, if there are standards identified between members of that uh, community to, you know, get feedback on them, combine them, make those available to be able to, right, there are a lot of cell types, cell states and variants to cover. So right. more than just one consortium's work. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And I think you also highlighted sort of one of the major challenges. We always at NHGRI want our data to have 
the broadest impact possible. But it is hard to understand or even think about all of the potential uses of the data and to sort of put it out there in a way that makes it most accessible for people. So I think if you see these kinds of data sets and you have thoughts about what would make it easier for you to use, I'm sure that there will be opportunities to provide that sort of feedback. Um, so I, I think we're almost out of time. I, I didn't get to all the questions, but I just wanna thank everyone for asking them in the chat. Uh, I also want to remind you that this is a quarterly seminar series. We haven't scheduled the next one yet, but we imagine it's going to be uh, in January, I think is what Chris said. Uh, so we hope you'll be able to join us for future talks. Keep an eye on our webpage and our social media uh, to uh, find updates about that. And I just want to, again, thank our speakers, Luca Pinello and Karen Mulkey, for these great talks and this really uh, exciting discussion. Um, and we hope to see you again at the next Genomic Innovator Seminar. <laughs>